Thank you for coming. We're almost at the finish line. It's been a great camp. Uh, so my name is uh, checking up. My name is Henrik Beschman, and uh, I'm a QID with uh, with uh, Airport. We're very happy to uh, be the premium sponsors for this camp. It's been a good camp for me. I hope it's been a good camp for you. And so I'm here to talk about behavior-driven development. Um, give an overview for the next. Uh, uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, we've got a 45 minute hour here because we're supposed to be back at uh, at the uh, gathering place for for final remarks in a few minutes. So I'm going to try to whiz through these uh, slides uh, fairly quickly so that hopefully we can have a bit of time to talk about some of this material at the at the end of it. Okay, so um, what's behavior driven development? Well, it's a just very generally it's a software development process. It's not a product. Um, it's a way of organizing software development. Uh, it has some very specific ideas. I think it has a mindset to go with it. So just very basic. How many of you have read or are aware of behavior-driven development generally? Yeah, so most people here I think is getting to be pretty well known. Um, so why use uh, uh, behavior-driven development? Well, you know, working with this for the last uh, many months um, at Therefore, um, I've sort of come to the conclusion that um, that uh, the, the real core benefit of behavior-driven development is to focus on value for the client. And the best way of focusing on value for the client is to impact the behavior of the users of the client website. So ultimately what we're, I mean it's quite interesting, ultimately what we're after here is impacting human behavior. Um, that's a good thing because it's a focus, it uh, supports the intentions of the client, it can also be a somewhat evil thing. Think Amazon.com. Uh, I don't know if you've ever bought anything on Amazon.com, which I have. You know, buy a book or something, and all of a sudden, four or five really interesting books show up as recommendations, and they've got this one-click uh, button. So they know what they're doing, and they're they are changing behavior. I think that's the sort of thing that they're doing. Thankfully, by the way, the one-click button is uh, patented. I gather by Amazon, so nobody else can use it. Um, in any case. Behavior-driven development, I see it in, in a few ways. You've probably read about the communication benefits of it. I think that, that, comes, that comes out clearly in the Gherkin language that I'll, that I'll cover. Um, it has automated ver uh, verification, you know, automated testing that can, you can get tools to do that and links in very well with the whole scheme. Uh, I'll cover some of that as well. Uh, something that's a little more subtle, uh, but I think is also very interesting, is that I think it's a way of dealing with the complexity that we're all facing now. I'm going to get into that a little bit because by providing focus, it not only, uh, it, and, and in particular focus on the value that you want to deliver to the client, it not only takes you to a solution, it also excludes a bunch of options because, uh, uh, you know, one of the key aspects of, of the whole approach is not to think about implementation but rather to think about uh, functionality and what you want. So by providing that focus, I think it, it actually helps to deal with the kind of almost overwhelming uh, options that we have available to us now. And I think that's, uh, that's quite an interesting thing. So just to be clear, uh, when I first heard about behavior-driven development, I thought, oh, it's talking about people or developers or something. It's actually talking about the behavior of the software. But on the other hand, you know, I think it can be used as a, as a bit of a, a dual meaning in the sense that it's a, it, it is quite opinionated about the behavior involved uh, uh, on the part of the people that are involved in development, and as I've already stated, the behavior of the ultimate client, but you know, it, it works well with Agile with Scrum. Uh, it expects, uh, it, you know, iterations uh, and that kind of thing. So, um, but fundamentally, it's talking about the behavior of the software. Um, the Gherkin grammar is really at the heart of it. I'm gonna get into this again in a little bit of detail, but just, uh, I think you've probably all seen this. Uh, there are stories, there are scenarios in order to benefit as a, as a role of some kind, I need to take an action, that's, a, that's the general format of the story. Uh, a scenario is use cases or kind of concrete applications of those stories, and that uses the keywords given, when, and then. This is, I think this is a, a thing of beauty and quite remarkable. Uh, again, I'll come back to that. But, um, so those, those are the kind of basic ideas that I want to, that I want to cover in this, so I'm going to, uh, fairly quickly, where is that clock? So I'm going to fairly quickly um, cover these points, the uh, growth of our technology, 
as kind of a background for the impetus of the development of this kind of thing, a general introduction to uh, uh, behavior-driven development, the, the um, uh, common language gherkin, and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the mechanics uh, of how uh, an automated tool be had for, uh, which is which is applied through a, um, through a module to uh, to Drupal um, can be used. I'm not going to do any live coding. I'm sorry, there isn't time. Uh, hopefully, if I'm uh, if I'm invited back next year, I'll be able to do some of that and actually show some of this in action. Although, if you saw the Merlin presentation, you've already seen some of this. So just really quickly. Um, in preparing this, uh, this presentation, I sort of took a little stroll down memory lane, which is fun for me. I've been involved with, uh, with uh, software for a long time. So, but I think it, um, I think it um, going back a little bit and looking at the trajectory that we're on uh, gives an idea of the kind of impetus for looking for better and better ways to produce software. You know, it's, uh, again, it's quite intense. So th these are just a couple of metrics. There's something like, uh, what are those numbers, 600 and some? Websites of which 100, and, I don't know, whatever it is, 184 million um, are active. Google, when it started in 1998, had 9.8 thousand queries in a day, and now it gets 3 billion per day. And I think this is just kind of indicative of where we're at, and, and I think there's been a kind of a parallel development in in the technology that we're using. Uh, so, um, what was that? So. Let's have a quick tour of the trajectory there, one because it's continuing and it's intense and it's uh, high pressure and it's a good reason to use a tool, a conceptual tool like a behavior-driven development to cope. So there's the first Apple. There's uh, Steve Jobs and uh, and Steve Wozniak uh, that had four kilobytes of uh, the first Apple of, of memory up to 48 kilobytes. I actually rented the first IBM PC in 1981. That's when I got started. It had something like 64K. You had to worry about you know using two-character memory variable names because you have to save space. There is the first modem. You know, I don't know if you remember those. Um, that wasn't that long ago. VisiCalc. I dug this up. This is the first. I, I actually remember this. This is you know when the IBM PC was released. People were saying, well. What good is it? You know, it's a it's a cool toy. And then, and then these uh, these people, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston, with ten thousand lines of code, not very much code, developed a spreadsheet where you could put in numbers and it automatically created created totals. And suddenly, the PC became credible in the business community, and that established the foundation of what was to happen later. Of course, what happened later was the uh, was the uh, internet bubble, as we know. Relational databases came along and supported that whole thing, particularly, uh, particularly MySQL. But I mean, I eventually, but I used them in DBase Paradox. That provided a lot of flexibility for developing applications. And of course, the big one was the development of Linux. There's the young Linus Torvalds with. Uh, I'm not sure what's in that bottle. I presume it's a health drink of some kind. Um, but it, when he, uh, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> When he first developed it, uh, when he first re released Linux, it was 176,000 lines of code. The core is now 15 million lines of code. And I gather that standard distributions have something like uh, 55 million lines of code. Okay, so th this is, that says a couple of things. There, you know, there was a time when we could do things on our own. That time is long gone, except for, you know, very simple sites. And that applies both to the tools that we use and the websites that we develop. And I think that's one of the one of the reasons. So design patterns came along in 1994 and I remember that at, at one time, you know, at first uh, the microcomputer community sort of inherited the, uh, the waterfall method and that was used. And I remember there was a lot of talk about we can refine this waterfall method so that we just do design at the front end and it'll spit out code in the back end. And then these guys came along, design patterns, say, no, no, wait a minute, you know, that's not how we learn from each other. We learn from the patterns, from the thought patterns, from the ideas that we have. And that proved to be much more useful, um, which I think, um, you know, had quite a long-term long, long -term effect. Obviously, the open source software movement, we heard some of that uh, uh, this morning in, the, in, that, uh, in that terrific keynote. Um, uh, the Open Source Foundation, there's Mark Anderson with uh, Netscape, which eventually was... Uh, which eventually was uh, handed over to Mozilla. Um, hang on. Uh, in 1998, which wasn't that long ago, you know, see how rapidly we're moving, Google came along. Uh, and then I actually remember this moment in 2004, 
they, uh, uh, Google Maps came along using Ajax. And I remember looking at that thing for the first time and said, thank you, Google. We have Ajax, we have the basis for interactive applications on the web now. They've kind of legit legitimized that, that type of thing. Uh, there's James Garrett that, uh, that, uh, that coined that term Ajax. A whole bunch of production tools uh, came along as excitement and uh, built an opportunity built. There's Drupal in 2001, PHP. Uh, you know, you recognize all these tools. Uh, there's Linus Torvalds for the second time with Git, which obviously was an important contribution. And, and now we have all this stuff going on, the JavaScript stack. Uh, Node.js was released in 2009. That's not that long ago. You know, and if you look at uh, NPM, the package manager site, it gets like 2 million downloads in a day, 55 million uh, in a month. And that's just over a very few years. So you can see the kind of pressure and the acceleration that's going on. And I think we're all experiencing that. Uh, we have new databases. I'm quite uh, keen on Neo4j as a graph database. So the whole relational thing is being challenged. And of course, we've got DevOps. DevOps. You know, I know, I know in our company we pass virtual machines around like candy and databases around like candy. Right? It used to be a few thousand codes for an application, the first killer application, visit calc, and now it's like these massive structures that are so coherent and so mature that we can uh, do quite a lot with them. So, oh, and let's not let's not forget the proliferating channels. We've seen a bit of this. We've got Google Glass and so forth. So it's just a very complex world is developing very very quickly. Uh, so um, there's been a change from you know we work on our own to we work in a group. Uh, uh, applications now uh, have such such a rich variety of sources to draw from, to draw from, and uh, my con one of my contentions is that. And by the way, Drupal 8 has been uh, magnificent with this in terms of the module structure. You know, that's that's uh, that's sort of analogous to what we can do with all these other tools, the mashups that we've talked about, the decoupling that we've seen at this uh, conference, and so forth. So. My contention is that in that complex environment, one of the ways to reduce the noise um, is by using behavior-driven development because it promotes lightweight applications, it avoids acquisitiveness, and what I mean is, oh look, there's a shiny, another shiny bottle, there's another shiny bottle, let's put it all together and see what it does. So exciting, no, no, no. Go back to the stories and see what the purpose is and just focus on that and then move on. And when you're done, stop and then move on. And that really helps, I think, to deal with all that noise. Avoid overcommitment to technology. Um, again, behavior-driven development focuses on uh, functions, not on implementation. It ignores the implementation. So um, I think that's actually uh, quite helpful. So what's been developer response to all this complexity and all this pressure to produce? Um, obviously, form teams. You know, for any any non-trivial applications nowadays, you you know you've got to have more than one people. That's pretty straightforward. But then we came along as a community and said, you know what? There's a better way than the wall, uh, than the uh, uh, waterfall method, and it's agile because it focuses on people over systems, it, on adaptation over prescription. And again, that's an echo from the patterns that we saw before. I think that's really important. Um, the next phase, uh, again in my submission, is the behavior-driven development. It's yet another way, based on experience, based on all this pressure, based on a lot of cycles and communication and the openness of our community, uh, forged under pressure, with a focus on value. It sort of takes the agile thing and other step uh, and scrum, uh, focus on value, common language, and test-driven automation. Uh, my personal take is, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, focus on user stories and provide lots of lead feedback loops everywhere. All the people involved, the clients involved, do that and, and move forward to the uh, goal that's been prescribed. So, just as a quick aside, I think, I think we're part, you know, and this is, reflects back to Mark's uh, point this morning, we're all part of a really important movement, I think. Uh, the commons, sharing things, uh, I mean, Linux? Are you kidding me? It's changed the world. You know, Google, for example, is based on Linux. We all use it as a back end. People first, that is um, unusual. We're in a high-tech business, and yet we have found by hard experience that relying on our talents, relying on our insights, relying on our communications, relying on ourselves as people 
is really the best way to move forward and get that efficiency. Think, think as if by contrast uh, with you know the way bureaucracies are organized, uh, you know. And, and so there are changes coming in the world. This is something we can contribute to the world. Let me just leave it at that. You know, don't let me go on too long about that. Okay, so here's behavior-driven development. I'm doing really badly on time. Uh, so quickly, it focuses on value through user stories, acceptance criteria, scenarios. I think you, everybody's pretty familiar with that. Gherkin is the key, that, that, that grammar. Um, and of course, it uses autom automation tools. And the interesting thing is that or one of the interesting things is that the language can not only be used to plan, but it can also be used to document. In other words, you can run the automated test and, and send the results back to user, even users if you wanted to, and that would make sense to them. Uh, everybody can understand it. Um, in short, it allows for top to bottom integration of your project with precise communication. I mean, having been in this business for so long, that's just, to me, that's astounding. That you can actually trace from the broad goals of an application right to the verification tests with a common language, with common statements. Uh, it's great stuff. So, again, very quickly, the, the pedigree or the evolution of, uh, of uh, uh, behavior-driven development obviously comes from uh, Agile Scrum. It comes very specifically from test-driven development. In other words, test-driven development, the next step. Uh, it comes from domain-driven development. I haven't actually read about this. I put it here because it comes up all the time. I've got the book. I haven't had time. I'll read it. That sounds really interesting. There's the Agile Manifesto. I'm not going to go over it in detail, but fundamentally, again, people over systems, adaptive over prescriptive, and that's been found to work. It produces higher, higher quality products, uh, and often it saves money. Kent Beck came along in 2003 and sort of sort of clarified this notion of test-driven development where you do the test first, you turn it on its head, right? And then you write to the test, again, it's focus. Uh, then you code, then you refactor and sort of refine your process that way. But he found that people were wandering, <laughs> wandering off and testing all kinds of things that wasn't really clear enough. It also points out that you should avoid uh, anti so-called anti-patterns like dependencies and whatnot. So then, Along comes Dan North, who uh, you know had, had had used test driven development. I've listed these people here because he seemed to interact with them uh, a lot. They took years to do you know, this Gherkin language that's so simple. It took them years, and I think that's one of the things I, I, I want to get across. You know, it's not just trivial. It's not just sitting down and marking something up uh, on the back of the envelope. It took them years to distill these concepts of. Uh, Finding focus, you know, the, dom the domain aspects, business analysis, and so forth, and distill it into something that could work in all these marvelous ways, distill it into something that was uh, accessible and yet highly usable. So, for example, as I said, it, it all depends on having very clear, a very clear goal. Uh, and so, one of the feeds at the top end, I'm saying, I'm talking about the integration here, it goes from the very top to the very bottom. I'm saying one of the feeds at the top end is discovering what features it is that people want. So you talk about the goals, you talk about the actors, the people, uh, the people that you want to impact, the impacts that you want to have on those people, and then through that process you discover the deliverables or the features that you're going to then put into the stories that you're then going to do use cases for and scenarios, and uh, you break those down iteratively until you come to work units for the developers. You can bring architects and business analysts <laughs> Uh, you know, in along the way as you go along um, and end up with uh, a clear path, an efficient path to the goal that you want. Quickly, goals should be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, timely. I, as a website owner, I want a website so that I can brag to my friends. Is not a good statement. Um, I've got an example of something, of something a little better than that. Um, Again, the, the point is, and I think this is something, you know, in the Agile methodology, we're all supposed to be contributing to, in a creative way, to the goals. And, you know, I'm suggesting that the fundamental goal here is to change people's behavior. So as you're developing, ask yourself, how is this going to impact somebody's behavior? If it's going to do nothing, don't do it. Move on. Do something else, I think, is, the, is one of the message. Have an impact. Think, always think in terms of, it, of an impact. Um, 
couple of, uh, I think, you know, it's a, it, the gherkin is a simple concept. It's very accessible, and yet it's hard to do. It takes practice. Uh, you know, an ad, a typical agile shop takes years to develop. Again, Dan North and his friends, it took them years to distill these things. So give yourself some time, but also understand that as you're formulating all these things up and down the chain, judgment really helps. You know, insight into uh, the business, into the technology, into the architecture. So bring your senior people in to work on this. Don't downplay it. And obviously you're going to want technology to support it, ticketing systems, communication, automation, you know, your, your management systems, Scrum, and so forth. So apply judgment, apply feedback. Apply judgment, <laughs> apply feedback. Take it seriously, it really works. Um, okay, so now the Gherkin language. Not, not too bad. Uh, this is worth looking. I mean, I think as a technical design artifact, this is a thing of great beauty um, because it's simple, it's accessible, it's understandable. It distills 20 years of experience uh, in an effective way. Uh, it incorporates history, it incorporates experience, it even incorporates wisdom. Um, and our experience is, I think, that the more we use it, you know, even though we're a bit clumsy to start with, somehow the dynamic of the whole thing pulls you towards better and better application. You know, keep repeating the stories, keep repeating the scenarios, and you'll get feedback for yourself. And you'll find that quite naturally you get quite a lot better at it. I just think it's astounding, I mean, as a, as a, as a technical design matter. Uh, so it's worth focusing on this, and it's, it's really very, very accessible. Okay, so here's, I think, a better example of the story at a project, at a high project level. And I guess one of my basic points is that scope is an issue. Uh, it's good to apply this at various scopes. Ultimately, you want to decompose things until you get a reasonable unit of work within Scrum, you know, within a couple of weeks for your developers. But so here's a very broad scope. Uh, as a vegetarian restaurant, I just made this up, took a few brain cells. As a vegetarian restaurant owner, I want our website to triple traffic, you see, measurable, in the next year in order to double sales. All that is measurable, there's a goal, you know, it's fairly clear, you can get feedback. It, but, but it's very broad and you can't really implement it directly. That's okay. It's a good place to start, it communicates. Um, you can take it down another level as a website. You so you're trying to you're trying to change people's behavior by by this planning process. So you go down to the next level as a website user. I want to get excited about shared food values on the website so that I can pursue my food passions. In other words, you know the story here is what can you offer the user that's going to engage them, that's going to actually change their behavior to achieve the goal that I just uh, talked about. It's still probably too broad in terms of actual development, but it's getting closer. Uh, we're now talking about you know, the website user and, so, and the experience that they might have. So you might go take it another level down as a vegetarian, as a vegetarian website user. I want to see a vegetarian user portal that I can relate to so that I can find, find my personal, essentially, food, food passions. Okay. Now there's something that you can that a developer can sink their teeth into. They see what's happening here, it's all kind of the same concept, the same structure, you just decompose it until you get to the right value. You don't want to get too small either, you want to give the developer something that they're going to be interested in and that's going to challenge them and so forth. But then you can get into scenarios and I guess another key point here is that what you want to do with this approach is, is cover all the main scenarios, not necessarily the weird edge cases, but you certainly want to cover all the main scenarios because not only is this a good planning tool, in other words, you hand, this to de you hand this, these kinds of scenarios to the developers, notice it's just functional, there's nothing here about implementation, that's the way it should be. Uh, implementation details, you know, I'm going to use this module for, for this, written in this scenario, that's an anti-pattern, don't do that. Functional inputs, outputs, leave it to the developer, that's the whole point of Agile, to, to take their personal talent, to take their input and decide how best to have an impact in the situation. This just describes the impact. But it's giving, it's giving enough detail that not only is it a good planning tool for the developer, but it's a good uh, acceptance test. It's a good automation test for when you're done. 
And again, that's the beauty of the system. You reuse the same ideas in various places. Everybody's talking the same language. And you know, if you had 10 or 20 scenarios or whatever for this particular story, uh, including error handling and whatnot, redirections and things like that, then in terms of the test-driven development history, what you really want to do, we're not quite there yet, but we're working on it, but therefore what you want to do is you want to give the automated test to the developer first, they run them, they all fail, but they're working towards making them all succeed. And when all the scenarios have succeeded, stop! <laughs> this is really important. You know, developers love shiny bottles and like going all over the place and stuff. When these specific scenarios, if they're well crafted, are done, stop, move on to the next story. Really good stuff. Um, so, I don't know, I've got another couple of examples here. You can you sort of keep breaking them down, okay? So it's a dynamic and comprehensive process. Notice that, you know, the scenarios are kind of exploratory at the planning stage as well. You can go back and forth with the clients, right, as a, as a business analyst, uh, to refine them. Well, what about this case? What about that case? And until it sort of settles down. Uh, just as the stories affect the scenarios, the scenarios affect the stories. That's agile. Lots of feedback all the time. Keep at it. So, a couple of tips. Um, Alex, the finder, uh, found this, uh, this acronym for a, a good story. It should be independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, testable. I won't get into each of those, but look it up. It's worthwhile. Smart and invest are the two acronyms that I think you might find useful. And again, it's all about scope. Uh, stories should represent an appropriate level of work. It turns out that the flexibility of the language, and particularly the, the, the test tools, are such that it's okay to use colloquial language. And what I mean by that is the, is the user's domain-specific language. And in fact, uh, I heard this tip in one of the tapes that I found, that you can write, and probably should, write stories to the role in the story. Right? So, um, you know, as a role of some kind. So write the story in a way that's meaningful to that role. It's likely to be more accurate. And you can do that if the whole thing still works. It's a very flexible system, and that's very cool. Domain-specific language. Um, so, shared, oops. I'm going the wrong direction here. Hang on just a second. So, just quickly, shared purpose, precise communication, top to bottom implementation. That's so important because everybody's on the same page. It's immensely important. Uh, testable specifications, living documentation, and uh, oh, a regression test suite. So once you run the test, you keep them. You just keep running them. You know, I think in Dave, is Dave here in, in his, uh, yeah, so it, you know, you were saying you weren't sure about this, and that's true. We bypassed this on some rather short projects, but if you have a project that's eight months long, you know, by the time you're in a month two or three, there's, bound, there's likely, very likely to be a ripple effect. So you run these tests, you just keep running them. They're there, they're free. And if something breaks, you'll see it. It's, it saves a lot of time and effort. Um, so regression testing kind of comes to you for free. Okay, so let me just, uh, not horrible. Stories provide context, scenarios provide executable specifications. Let me just, oh, so for the automation part, and I'm just gonna very quickly talk about the mechanics of how this works. Get a tool. Uh, B had is a good one for Drupal. Um, get this, uh, get this uh, module called Drupal Extension. You see, there's uh, the Drupal drop and a B hat. Um, there, those are the two people that have contributed that uh, to the community. But get a tool. This is it's a very good tool. Uh, this combination gives you not only the automated testing that you have with any number of these tools, but it also gives you full access to everything about Drupal, including Drush, all the functions and everything. It's, it's very cool. Um, you can scan over that. These are the bits that you would install. Selenium, obviously. So the main workflow is you write the feature scripts, which is that English language, that Gherkin language. Then you write PHP methods, which most of well, there are a lot of default statements that come with the tool, but if you have to write one, you can you, you just write a PHP method in a class. Uh, uh, pretty straightforward normally, although you can get into really weird stuff if that's what you want to do. And then run the test, get the feedback. So that's it's very basic workflow. 
So here's the script that is actually parsed by BHAT, and you can see it's virtually identical to the scripts that are used in the planning you know, in the planning sessions with the client, with the developer, with whoever. Virtually identical. Again, everything gets very specifically tied together. Um, never mind looking at the code here. What I want to point out here is the way this works is that the BHAT engine looks at those statements and then transforms it into a regular expression and then looks for the regular expression string. And if it finds it, it runs the function right by that string. And if it doesn't find it, it actually generates the regular expressions for you in the console so you can just copy and paste it in. So next time it'll be available uh, to you. So it's a, it's, you know, again, it's a very cool system. And it turns out that, you know, first of all, you don't have to write the regular expression yourself because it does it for you. Secondly, it's not that hard. It's not that complex. Essentially, it's all assertions. Then, uh, uh, for example, is is, uh, is simply ignored. They're all essentially assertions, and uh, uh, quote delimited values are treated as you can see their label and type. Quote delimited values are essentially treated as variables that are or parameters that are passed to your functions. So everything you know flows together quite well. You can also um, Okay, so yeah, here's another example. Then I should see the about link in the navigation region by language. By language, we have a we have a site that has a couple of languages. In this case, you know, language comes up quite a lot. So by language is a very natural way to put this. You can you can reuse the same test for different languages. All you do in the uh, underlying code is you develop a little translation routine of your own, uh, uh, translate the particular string and then run something called a, uh, uh, a meta step, which is an existing step, but this time you're inserting the actual translated values. Very straightforward, and yet, you know, big bang for the buck because you're getting, you know, the different language websites uh, tested essentially for the, for the same code. So what happens with that process is that the feature step is written in English, and again, it can be used to communicate with all the other people in the project. It finds a regex, it runs the PHP method that's associated with it. It calls the Selenium hub server, which, is, you know, Selenium just runs browsers. That's what it automates browsers. That's what it does. The Selenium hub server calls the node server. So from the server to your particular machine. And by the way, you can have a bunch of machines going here and you can stress test with it. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, that calls WebDriver, which controls the browser. And of course, there's feedback the other way. I didn't want to get into that. So, am I communicating here? You're going from the top level to the very bottom level with the same conceptual tools in a very practical way. And it's giving all kinds of feedback that really helps. You've got planning, you've got communication, you've got reduction of the complexity simply by focusing so much on how am I going to impact this user's behavior? Uh, and you're focusing on value. There you have it, an overview, planning specification and verification in one seamless package. My conclusion, it's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> I'm guessing we have about five minutes for, well, not very much time, I'm sorry, for a discussion. Any comments, questions? So you had a couple of so We use a tool called Codeception. It was another PHP suite for running tests. Um, yeah. The cool thing about BDD is that um, from the top, and your product owners have written these stories, and you've made, you've made, you know, these scenarios. Um, it assigns a business value to every commit. Oh, interesting. In. Yeah. So every commit, I mean, it basically yeah. means dollars. You yeah. know, it, it it went into, you know, there was this value to it. Yeah, and, and it's very specific, it's very measurable, and you could probably come back a year from now and yeah, see, and you see what the results have been. Fantastic. Planning with that, that whole iteration yeah. loop, yeah. especially with Agile, right? Yeah. You take that time at the end to bring your output back in right. to learn from it. You can take that time and that, you know, all those commits and go, oh, you know, that was about a week's worth of work. Yeah. So it actually makes planning in the future a lot easier, too. You learn from it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just another feedback mechanism, and it's a good one. Because, I mean, experience is, and, you know, Martin Fowler talks about this, you know, agile teams take years. They go through three or four phases that he specifies, and you just keep at it, and you keep getting better and better. That's one of the remarkable things about these two worlds, is it tends to make people better as opposed to, I don't know, pissed off or tired of it or something. It just gets more exciting, because you're having an impact, and we all want to have an impact. 
Surely, that's why we're passionate about this business. Alex, you guys saw the uh, the, the keynote today. Um, there was mention of uh, Simon uh, Sinek, and Simon Sinek. If you, if, yeah. if you haven't seen the TED talk, you should really watch it. Yeah. Now, one of the things that, well, the main thing that he talks about is is why, right? So there's actually a very close correlation between this methodology and his methodology. So if you look at the Gherkin, you, you have the why statement, yeah, yeah. right? And then you have the who statement, yeah, which he doesn't and then have. you have the what statement, yeah. right? It's, it's yeah. very close though yeah. in concept, yeah. right? Well, he's got the why, how, and what, yeah. and Gherkin adds the who in there. Right. Uh, but yeah, they're very close, and that's a great point. Uh, I think one of the reasons that this is so potent is that they've managed to distill these concepts um, that they, that they've managed to distill very generic concepts, concepts that are really ap applicable in lots of ways. So that's a great point. And that, I think, reinforces the notion that this is really something worth looking at and worth working at. Great point. Mike? Uh, just look up uh, Simon Sinek. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, sir. It's, um, I, I like the, um, I like the roll of rolls. Yeah. Uh, role, I think, is a really key word. In the user experience or the UX community, there's a lot of emphasis on personas these days. Um, oh, yes. I yes. personally don't use them. I don't find them very useful. Yeah. Someone said they prefer the archetype idea, which is slightly more general than particular personas. Yeah, I mean, to me, personas are just great ways to write fiction. And yeah. I think the fiction is useful if you really are dealing with, say, developers who have no idea of what uh, they're doing. Five minutes in the Cool. I, I thought we were. Oh, we're doing good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. I think roles get Five, down to minutes. business, uh, and you kind of prove that. So I like. I'm glad I came and saw. Excellent. Yeah. That's being reinforced on that side. Yeah. I want to add one little story though. Sure. Because you talked about speaking in the language of the role, the Calgary role. The domain-specific language. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really critical. I think. Uh -huh. um, but it, it's still tricky. I mean, there's one example. I recently did a usability study for uh, a college website. Um, the objective of the study was to find out if the website was functioning uh, as a recruitment platform for prospective domestic students. Okay. So the target role is prospective domestic students. Yes. And that language was used throughout the website. And the <laughs> target users did not understand those terms. So wherever they Or would saw, be turned off by it. Well, they just didn't understand yeah. it. You know, so for example, one user uh, clicked on domestic uh, fees when, I asked, uh, when we asked a question about uh, where, would you, where would you live, yeah. you know, residence. Uh, perspective was just no idea what that meant. Because the target users were high school kids. Right, yeah. You know what, they weren't communicating in the language of the user in that case. In their own terms. Yeah. They, 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 they communicate they in the language of yeah. the, the administration. Not, of the, not the, of the students, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a great, great, great story. Yeah. I think there was a question back here, was there? Comment? Yeah. Anybody else? The other side of the persona is I've seen, I've seen it work in that you build people like Sally, the, the old lady, like she's your user type. And as a developer, you're sitting around a table talking with a feature and you go, I don't know if Sally's going to be able to use that. So yeah. it like, puts a face. You know what, th this, yeah, that's, so that's, that's the only that's purpose I would use it for. I, I was yeah. sort of saying that when Chris yeah. walked in, but that was the only value. It's really, uh, I think it gets taken too far. Yeah. By People have come with it, right? And they, you know, pull up pictures. Yeah. Like these big backstories. But, but, but it yeah. keep, just keeps it in your head. Yeah, yeah. So no, like no, eight listen, one, one of the interesting <laughs> points that that raises is that it's been found that BDD doesn't work well in isolation. Uh, it works well in a scrum environment, an agile environment, and by all means, you know, through all these other tools we were talking about, uh, prototyping before, uh, impact mapping, uh, you know, uh, architectural uh, studies, feasibility studies, business anal anal analysis. Go ahead and do all that stuff as appropriate, but then bring it all in. And in fact, uh, behavior-driven development, I think, has been found to work best if you, in fact, do that as appropriate. But in the end, focus on the stories because that's what's going to provide the common thread from the top to the bottom. That's what's going to provide your productivity, and that's what's going to provide the value for your for your clients. I think. Oh, two more minutes. I think. Any other comments, questions?
Well, I, if, I could, if no one else is going to say, I'll say, I think value is the key word. Yeah. Right, it's all about value. Absolutely. But yes. again, it gets down to definitions of value. Yes. And that is very much tied to the role. Yes. And, I'm, and understanding that role. Right, so the value for the client has to translate to the value for the website user and so forth. And, and this method gives you an opportunity to tell the stories from everybody's perspective and you would want to work through all the roles that are involved. Uh, however you want to define that, you want to work through all the roles involved to, more, to make sure you're capturing all of that in relation to the top level requirements of the project. Yeah, that's a great story. So listen, why don't we call it a day. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been fun. Thank <laughs> you.